because I think there's a lot here around health literacy and I think there's a lot here around um, understanding the underlying culture and what we're trying to put on top of a culture and then wonder why it's not quite working. So um, I'm going to start by letting them introduce themselves. Uh, Danny, do you want to kick things off here? Sure. Hi, I'm Danny Van Leeuwen and um, I'm known as Health Hats. And I'm Health Hats because I'm a patient. I have multiple sclerosis. I've been a caregiver for three family members' end of life journeys. I'm a nurse. I'm an informaticist. I'm a musician. I'm an OPA. I'm a healthcare leader. I wear lots of hats. And like you, um, you all wear lots of hats as well. And uh, what I do is I wear all my hats at once. And um, my, um, my, what I'm interested in is I'm interested in what works for people. And um, certainly uh, what works about making choices. Um, tough to follow that. So, um, so I'm Karen Ladine. I'm an assistant professor at Tufts University, um, and I direct the REACH Lab, which is research on ethics, aging, and community health. Um, a lot of the work that we do um, examines shared decision making and patient activation, patient empowerment, um, and specifically in areas around dialysis initiation, end of life, um, and in transplant. Hi, and I'm Sue Berg. I'm the program director for the Center for Shared Decision Making at Dartmouth Hitchcock in New Hampshire. And um, the goal of our, uh, we have several programs within the center where the goal of those programs is to help empower patients to partner better together um, with their clinicians. And I came to this work, I've been with the center about a little over 10 years now, um, but I came to this with a background as a genetic counselor and I uh, learned quickly when I switched into shared decision making that, although we didn't call it shared decision making when I was a genetic counselor, that's what we were um, doing. Um, so I had spent over 20 years helping people make a lot of really um, difficult decisions. And so that was a good segue in, into the work that I now do um, with patients which, with much more common diseases than I dealt with um, as a genetic counselor. Um, hi, my name is Erica Spatz. I'm a cardiologist at Yale, and I'm a, both a clinician and a researcher. Um, I practiced primary care for many years and came into cardiovascular medicine with an eye towards thinking that we provided too much care and wanted to be a steward of better utilization of care. Um, I also have a background in public health and in global health, and part of um, my role now is trying to balance how we improve population health while being sensitive to the individual preferences and context in which people live their lives and uh, tailoring those uh, goals to individuals. Okay, so I think you get a sense for we have a person, we have a physician, we have a researcher and an implementer. So we've kind of covered everything here and I'm going to take one minute to level set around shared decision making. I think it's a uh, uh, deceptively named in some ways. So the idea is that it's a process where you have at least two experts in the room. The patient is the expert in their, you know, what is important to them, their goals, their values, what they want out of their quality of life. The physician is ideally an expert in the treatment options and then together along with their family members and anyone else they can figure out what's best. Now there are a lot of challenges with this. I think the underlying culture of medicine is a huge one that we'll be getting at, but you know, also, oh, by the way, the physician is supposed to be completely unbiased about all the treatment options and what he or she thinks you should do, um, and that it's really a process that was ideally meant for preference-sensitive decisions, where there's not an obvious best right thing to do, otherwise they'd just be telling you, well, this is the obvious thing to do. Um, and so, you know, it really is about helping, not taking away from the patient any kind of autonomy, but really giving them that self-determination and ability to even take part in this discussion uh, and process. Uh, I think a couple things it isn't. It isn't a decision aid, which are great resources and can really help before or during clinical encounters, but is not shared decision making. Um, 
it's not, again, taking that autonomy away, and it's certainly, I think, not happening as much as we would like or as envisioned. So with that, we want to start by going through each of these three, knowledge, heart, and courage. So knowledge, or the brains, um, Jesse Grumman said when she was talking about patient engagement that people need to understand that their participation is important, but they also need to be oriented to what it is is even going on. And I often find uh, in my work, uh, and I think everybody is finding that even people who have been living with conditions for a long time often don't understand what's going on. Uh, I work with heart failure patients all the time who think that that's an acute condition that they're going to get over. Uh, I've been stunned to see uh, people with end-stage renal disease not even know that they had a life-limiting condition, let alone that they were heading towards these very serious decisions. Or people with things like Crohn's disease where they're experiencing these flare-ups and they don't really understand that when they're not having a flare-up there can still be silent damage. So even people who feel like they know what's going on often are a little bit disoriented, let alone people who are getting a new diagnosis. So. Um, you know, I want to I want to start by really asking Danny. You know, for you as as a as an MS patient and even as a as a nurse, like what do you need to be able to participate in terms of knowledge and understanding? Um, well, um, I would say that um, uh, after I got diagnosed with MS, so MS for me is a progressive disease. And, um, you know, I met this, you know, neurologist who said, you know, I know really a lot about um, therapeutics for populations, and actually I don't know crap about you. And um, my goal is to learn uh, more about you, so I want you to go home and I want you to come back in two weeks and let's talk about what's important to you. And I like, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm like, I'm an e-patient, you know, and I'm like really good at this shit, but I was like nowhere. And so I had a family meeting and, you know, we came down to, um, you know, that, um, you know, I, I wanted to progress as slowly as possible. I didn't want to do anything to mess with my pathological optimism and I wanted to keep playing my baritone saxophone. So these are the things that are important to me. And so, you know, I went to the neurologist and I gave him that and he says, okay, we can work with that. Um, but what I really found is that um, I put zero effort into learning about MS. I just could not bring myself to do what I did for my mother, what I did for my son, what I, you know, did for my grandmother, you know, um, you know, to become an expert. I just, I don't know. I couldn't do it. I had no interest. And so it was my wife who did the research. And, um, and um, you know, I mean, so I, I'm a firm believer that I'm the CEO of my health journey. But, you know, I have a ton of subcontractors. And, um, and, and also, I, you know, there's so many goddamn decisions. You know, it's like putting in a new kitchen. You know, everything you got to decide. And I'm just not interested. Um, I'll make decisions about, you know, I don't want to mess with my pathological optimism. You know, so I'll make decisions about that. But pretty much I want a team and, and, you know, let my wife advise me. And I trust my neurologist and I trust my primary care physician. And I just don't want to make all those decisions. So it's sort of weird. Okay. So Erica, as a clinician, um, you know, have you been surprised by how much or how little people understand about what's going on for them in order to even start a discussion about treatment options or patient preferences? Like, what is your experience about? Right. Um, I think that, Danny, your experience really resonates with me because I, you know, it is a process, it is a dance uh, between a clinician and a patient, and it doesn't happen in one encounter. And there are multiple times that I've been working with someone and then all of a sudden pause because I realize actually that there's a big knowledge gap. And it's really hard to think about what are the best, uh, what's the best, best path forward for this person um, is not clear. And it's because I'm not clear about how they conceptualize their illness and whether or not I fully understand what's important to them. And people don't wear their goals on their sleeves. Most of us, if I said, what's your goals for the next five years, you know, professionally or as a patient, most of us, I would venture to say, don't know them. But as what I have found is that as people learn, 
in light, you know, through conversations, they start to think about what's important to them and that that is an important process of checking in and making sure because I would maybe say, Danny, that yes, your goals are to continue playing the, bar uh, the baritone sax and those are, or other uh, path pathological optimism, I love that, you know, but then there are daily goals, right? And there are daily burdens. And when does that come into play? Because of course, most people want to live a productive and healthy and high quality of life. But, you know, then how do we wrestle with what's involved and whether or not it's worth those trade-offs of whether it's taking a medication or taking out time from work to do therapy, cardiac rehab, all of these things kind of have trade-offs. And it's really helpful to understand the person's preferences and then the social context and their community context that um, may help to make best decisions. So Karen, in your research, what are the barriers um, to patients really understanding their condition and prognosis and orienting them at all to what's going on? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are a lot of barriers. I think in my, in my own work, you know, some of the, the communication is really kind of this key point that you both are raising. Um, so one gap that we found in our work is really around health literacy, kind of what words are clinicians using versus um, what are patients hearing um, when they say these words. So as an example, um, uh, oftentimes clinicians who are talking to patients who are approaching dialysis tell them about the need for interventions. And what they mean are surgical procedures to create a fistula or things like that. And um, in our research with many patients, patients actually shut down and were really offended and interpreted intervention and kind of the meaning of like a family meeting around an addiction. Um, you know, not understanding why their clinician thought that they needed an intervention. Um, and so, you know, these kinds of gaps in um, terms that are commonly used to explain either treatment options or to even ask questions about what's important to you, um, I think are, are very important. Um, in particular, we found that um, terminology around um, advanced care planning is really poorly understood, uh, kind of widespread in the population, and, um, you know, somewhat because of that and somewhat also because of clinicians' kind of uh, fear to confront emotion. Um, these conversations just don't happen. And so I think, um, you know, this is kind of the best scenario that, that we've seen in our research. The more common is just um, missed opportunities for the most part and some regret around really going down a treatment path that isn't aligned with people's preferences. And Sue, so how do you find that the decision aids that you help to provide to patients uh, impact this understanding? And starting point. Sure. So just for people that may not know exactly what a decision aid are, there are tools that can be, um, most of them nowadays are web-based, but they can also be a paper-based um, tool that combine um, evidence-based medical information about the options that a person might be facing presented in a way that is um, accessible to people to understand, and also to help people think about what's important to them as they're considering their decisions. Now, one of the things that's great about a decision aid is if you have somebody like in, in your situation where like you're maybe not ready to look at it, but your wife wants to see it, um, the person's circle of care is able to look at, look at these tools and get the exact same information as the patient so that the patient's not put in a position of having to relay everything and, um, you know, to other people that are interested. But there's been a lot of um, studies, the most recent Cochrane Review was in 2017, that show, um, the studies show over and over that people who utilize decision aids have increased um, knowledge of their options, more realistic expectations about what the outcomes may be, um, lower their decisional conflict, so their uncertainty about what's the best option for them, and um, that it actually improves patient-clinician um, interactions. So there's lots of studies out there that show when they are used, and that's a whole other discussion we can have is how do you get people to actually um, look at them, how available are they, and th those are all um, uh, important issues to talk about. But 
in my own practice, what I've seen, um, we have a system for some of our patients, uh, women in the breast cancer um, center, men with prostate cancer, people being seen by an orthopedic specialist about hip or knee osteoarthritis, where we actually provide decision aids to patients before they go to see that specialist. And what we find, what patients tell us, and also clinicians, is that um, they can have a more effective conversation with their clinician when they've looked at this, because the clinician doesn't need to spend their limited time with the patient explaining, so what does your breast look like inside? Because they've seen that in the decision aid, and they can actually come to the visit with more um, specific, unique questions and concerns um, about them rather than just the general um, questions that, that you might have about, you know, what is this condition that I'm, I'm dealing with and what are my um, choices. Um, the other thing is that um, clinicians have actually told us that they um, feel that they feel better about the um, visits that they have with patients because they can focus their limited time on that patient's unique questions and concerns um, when they already come in with some information and really understanding that they have a choice. Um, uh, lots of times people don't realize that that they have a, um, different options um, for their treatment. So that's also really important. And that part of shared decision making is not, I'm going to give you all the information and now you go forth and figure it out. If a patient wants their clinician to give them a recommendation, that's part of shared decision making. And that's part of what comes out in this and, and what good decision aids make clear to patients is that this is a partnership with your clinician and that you're not on your own. Right, so I think it's, it's really interesting because I've seen that too where um, people either are worried they're going to cede their autonomy, but more what I hear from the clinicians, and I don't know if any of you want to speak to this, is that, well, I asked my patient if they want to do shared decision making and they just kind of shrugged and looked at me and said, just tell me what to do. So I don't know how any, what your response is, is to that. I often just feel that or see that people aren't oriented enough to even begin to have a conversation, and then the doctors interpret that as, see, people don't, don't really want to do this. I'll start with that answer. Um, what I always say to clinicians that say that is, you know, if your patient wants a recommendation from you, that's great, but what your job is, is in your discussion with that patient to really elicit their values and goals and what's important to them. So then instead of, you know, the patient says the question, well, what would you do if I was your mother? They're not really asking, you know, what would you do for your mother? They're asking, what do you think is best for me? And if you can have that conversation so you can then say, well, based on our conversation, I think this is what will um, most likely provide you with, with what you're looking for, then that's still shared decision making. And you're respecting that person's um, desire for the clinician um, to make a recommendation. Well, um, what I appreciate um, with my um, uh, team is um, they go a lot that um, this is not an exact science that, you know, um, again, I was telling you about my neurologist who said he knew about therapeutics and populations. And, um, you know, you're, and, and so my, my team really um, has this, um, you know, this is an experiment. You know, um, I have some ideas about what might work and are maybe more likely to work. And when I hear those words, I know this is a, somebody I want on my team. Um, because then we can talk about, okay, we're, we make, like I let him or her make the decision, okay, I'll do it, I trust them, I'll do this. But I expect that they're gonna, next time I see them, or by portal, or whatever way we communicate is, well, did it work? Is it working? You know, and then it's like, yeah, it's working. Well, good. Let's go on to something else. Or no, it's not. Okay, let's try something else. You got to adjust. And so I feel like it's that, you know, back and forth with checking. See, then I get engaged. Like the decision, I sort of don't care. You know, it's like, let's just try it. You know, we'll see. Yeah, I would say also, you know, there's a fear among clinicians that we're moving away from evidence-based medicine, that we were, 
you know, went through training and education to provide the very best, very latest, up-to-date data. And that is how um, you're evaluated by your peers, is your knowledge base. And what I would then say to medical students and to trainees is, well, how strong is that knowledge base? You know, how strong is the evidence? What do the guidelines? So there is some anchoring in those conversations to say there's a lot of uncertainty. Actually, when a bunch of experts got together, they only were, you know, mediocre on this, this recommendation. So that actually gives us a lot of latitude to say, you know, there's different options that may be reasonable here. And I think that some of the most talented clinicians are those that are really actually really evidence-based because they understand the strength of the evidence or they can convey that to people, not just in, you know, what's the relative risk reduction or the absolute risk reduction number needed to treat, which is always like touted as being patient sensitive, but really to try to help understand how much uncertainty is there, how much latitude, how strong are the guidelines. If a guideline is really strong, but we're going to do something outside of that guideline, then we should make that decision understanding that, um, that that's what the case is and that there may be certain reasons why we're not considering it. Because I think it gets confusing also when people go to see different doctors, they get different recommendations, and that often sounds, that can be a very vulnerable place, it's very confusing, and people start to lose trust in the medical system. I often see people as like a second, third, fourth consultation, and it seems like they've gotten so many different recommendations. But, you know, and they're not wildly off recommendations, but people are trying to make a fit with a patient but not giving them the, going back to your first question, you know, how much do you need to know about your disease, but how much do you need to know about, like, how much space we have to make decisions within? Yeah, it's a really good point because um, one of the most interesting things about developing decision aids is working with these, you know, various specialists across uh, one decision. And they all see people at different points in time, and they all have different knowledge bases. And it's really fascinating to hear how what they think all the other specialists are doing is wrong, and you're sending people to me too late. And now when I get them, they're, they're in a very difficult situation to make a decision. So it's really fascinating also to think about the different knowledge base and experience that the clinicians are bringing to the conversation as well. So I want to move on to the heart emotion piece, because I think um, this one has been really overlooked. Uh, so with shared decision making, we focus a lot on information. There's treatment options. There's how good is the clinical evidence for these different things we want to do. Um, and there's all these trade-offs. And we're trying to present risk information in ways that people can understand, which is really important. But what we also know is that we don't really think risk. We feel it. If I tell you all, oh, you need to get a flu shot, it's really dangerous this year, people don't feel that threatened. We know this because they don't go get flu shots. Um, but they'll be really afraid of a tornado that has a very small chance of affecting them. And it's just the way that we're wired. Um, we're pretty predictably irrational in a lot of ways. And there's been interesting research by neuroscientists who look at brain-damaged patients where they've lost that ability to really have strong emotions or emotions of any kind. And they find that they pretty much lose the ability to make even the smallest decision. Because you think you're just looking at data, but what you're doing is you're feeling tugged by your emotions. Because back to the preferences, certain things are important to you or more important to you. Um, and so we also add to this then in healthcare that people are already kind of in these emotionally like difficult moments where they've either been given a new diagnosis or their condition has gotten worse. And uh, we've seen that even like one in five women actually experience PTSD when diagnosed with breast cancer. So thinking about these challenges with emotion, um, Karen, I know that part of what you've looked at is both the emotions that the patients and the clinicians experience. So could you talk a little bit about what you see? Um, sure. So, um, so on the patient side, um, oftentimes there's, you know, a lot of emotion associated with kind of charged words. Um, so I gave the example of intervention, but other things as well. So kind of 
um, kind of to your point, how much do, under, do patients understand, you know, what, if they have like chronic kidney disease or they're advancing to end-stage renal disease, even once they're on dialysis, um, do they understand that this is a condition that will last kind of throughout, this is the last stages of, of life? Um, and that can be very emotional and affect the way in which they think about kind of other important decisions, advanced care planning, comorbid conditions, et cetera. On, um, I think that there are research is found in others as well that there's a perception amongst clinicians that um, you know if you're delivering news like about prognosis or about um, uh, the need to continue a treatment that is challenging um, for long periods of time, even forever, that that's just an omitted part of the conversation. So, what we found in our studies with uh, patients. Uh, on dialysis patients 75 years and up is that um, clinicians had never had conversations with them about the need to continue dialysis forever, the implication that they won't, um, their, their kidney disease is not going to just improve. Um, and when we studied a national sample of nephrologists to really ask, you know, tell us why you're not telling your patients about their prognosis, tell us about um, you know, why you're not telling them that this condition may persist, a lot of them say things like, you know, we don't want to diminish hope. We, you know, our job is to ensure that the patients are hopeful, to make sure that they feel good about their treatment. Um, we don't want people to shut down. We don't want them to, you know, to not come back, which I think are really real concerns on clinician side. And um, I think what was most profound to us is that many of the clinicians, especially nephrologists, just said, you know, I don't feel trained to have these conversations. I feel trained to explain to somebody the difference between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis and try to work with them about which of these active treatments. So kind of, again, thinking about active versus, you know, conservative management or active surveillance. Um, so I think a lot of the, a lot of the emotions are really um, linked to the, the terms that we're using, um, not all therapeutic um, options are seen equally because some are more active and some are more passive and I think clinicians want to offer things and patients, um, you know, as much as it is difficult, over 80% of patients, even with um, end-stage renal disease, want a prognosis. So I think just the knowledge about that. Yeah, so, but yeah. there's a lot, it seems like, with the clinicians feeling bad that they don't have more to offer to patients. Yep. Or wanting to feel that they're doing something for patients, even though they may be at a stage where there's not. We're doing something would be helping them really manage their quality of life. Right, yeah. right. So especially, you know, we study older patients, 75 years and up, many with comorbidities. Um, and so it's actually, it's a very preference-sensitive decision, right? You, the survival benefits of dialysis versus active surveillance or, um, you know, conservative management are about the same in this population. And yet, in the U.S., it's one of the only countries in the world where we routinely offer a dialyze patients over 75, and most patients report that they've never heard of a different option. Um, so kind of, you know, to your point, it's a lot about the emotions and how clinicians are perceiving, you know, telling somebody that their, you know, their option might be best if they don't pursue dialysis. Right. So Danny and Erica, I'm interested from both of you as a patient and clinician, you know, how, how do you try and process emotions or give people time and help them process these emotions? I'm sure you see that like flat affect or moments of panic and people aren't really going to absorb a lot of information, but you have limited time with them. So just what is your, as a clinician and as a patient, your own emotions in dealing with these situations? So I'm a cardiologist and we have lots of interventions. We have tons of interventions for people of all ages and all types and it is a rapidly developing field and I would venture to say that most people, most students, residents go into cardiology today because that is exciting to them and there is, um, there is a concept that we can continually offer new and different ways of doing things, altered ways of doing things, less invasive ways of doing things. Um, it is one of the hardest things to sit on your hands and support, bear witness, you know, deal with the harder aspects of getting older. Um, just like a 
anecdotal um, story. Uh, yesterday I was with a patient who's in his late 70s and he's a patient that has multiple comorbidities and he's not doing great and he's not doing great and I'm not totally sure why but overall he's slowing down, sleeping a lot more, less engaged, a little bit more forgetful and occasionally gets short of breath. And so he was sent to me because he occasionally gets short of breath. But when I actually spoke to him, it was the shortness of breath was just a small part, although it felt like the easiest thing that I could like possibly potentially improve. And so the recommendation was, so that he came to me was, why hasn't he had a stress test recently? And we talked about like, we could do the stress test, but I just don't know if that's where, if that's gonna lead where we want to go. And trying to kind of figure out how to help people in a meaningful way to achieve their goals is really hard because often we don't have the answers and it feels like you should offer something. And so we go off after what we think we can fix and maybe make a claim that this is gonna improve everything, but you know, I'm not totally sure what that stress test would do. Maybe we, right. I'm sure we'd find something and I'm sure we could, you know, open up something or maybe that shortness of breath could be improved, but right. I'm not totally sure. And it sure might make even you feel better as a clinician to have that insight. So, Danny, I know when we were talking before, you said a lot of the reason why you haven't become an expert in MS is because it's very visceral and emotional for you. Um, Can I um, take a different tact sure. at this? Okay. Yeah. So the thing that, um, so I have trouble sleeping. And actually, the person on my team who has helped me the most is my chiropractor. And um, so, like, you know, I'm, I, I sleep like shit. And, you know, he, um, it turns out that, you know, in the middle of the night, what am I worrying about? Like, he's asking me this stuff. Well, I'm worried about falling, you know, because that really is the biggest, my biggest danger is falling. You know, I'm going to knock myself out. I'm going to break something. Then I can't keep up the nice pattern that I have, you know, my program to stay fit and whatever. And so um, last time I, I was in, uh, he spent, we spent 10 minutes, and it doesn't seem like a long time, but we spent 10 minutes going over, um, okay, so you're, you know, worrying about falling. Okay, so then it was like, um, let's see, what's important? Uh, your core strength. So let's go over the routine you have to keep your core strength up. Um, you know, you're getting your steps. What are the channel? What are you going to do when winter comes? You know, how are you going to keep your steps up? That's really important. You have your routine in the morning where you do your balance stuff, your stretching, your strengthening. But anyway, but he really, in 10 minutes, I mean, I felt, and this is my chiropractor, you know, I feel like he just honed in and dealt with the thing that scares me the most. And um, I felt like, well, I got listened to, I got a plan. I mean, I still might, I mean, he was like, you know, no guarantees, you know, who's going to guarantee you're not going to fall? Um, but, you know, I felt like, you know, it was very, it was unusual. I felt I came out of that like, whoa, what was that? You know, like this was, um, you know, anyway. Um, Sue, do you find that in your work to implement the process of shared decision making that there, you know, how, how, do, how do you get at these emotions with patients? Oh, and even their family members, which we haven't really touched on. I even find sometimes that the family members can have stronger emotions than the patient that almost need to be managed because they might be pushing them towards a much more aggressive treatment out of concern for them or... Um, well, maybe a little bit, kind of like you did before sure. I, I addressed that. <laughs> Go for it. Um, well, I was just thinking when um, Karen was talking about the research about um, how many clinicians don't feel confident in their ability to have these kinds of conversations about prognosis is um, one of the programs that we have is around advanced care planning, and we partner with... Um, the palliative care team at our hospital. And one of the things that they've started doing is actually teaching a skills-based class for um, clinicians how to have a shared decision-making conversation around serious illness. And part of that conversation is really explicitly asking a patient, how much do you want to know? Um, and 
you know, because it was the same sort of thing. So like, patients don't want to know this. We don't want them to lose hope. But making it very explicit for the patient, like, do you want to know about prognosis? Do you want to know about time left? So that they open the door to that conversation, but in a way that really respects the person's um, ability to control how much information um, they have. So that's something that's, that's been happening. And it's, it, the conversation is designed to be, I think, a 15-minute conversation with the clinician. So it's not like this long, um, drawn-out conversation. Um, the, um, to, to your point, I think, you know, in terms of um, dealing with the emotions of the, the whole family, again, I think it's a little bit of a culture change that you don't just have the patient in front of you. I think pediatrics is way better at this than anybody else because your patient is, is the child, but you have to deal with the, the family. And I, and I think um, bringing the family into those conversations, how much do the family members want to know? How can you support each other? Um, one of the things that um, we offer at our center is decision support counseling by health coaches, so not um, people that are part of the clinical team. And we use a framework um, called the Ottawa Personal Decision Guide. And one of the pieces of that, there's a couple of things where it brings in other uh, members of your support team. And um, one of those is asking the patient, who is supporting you? How are they supporting you? How do you want them to support you? And I have found that to be really powerful. It almost becomes a little bit of couples counseling. I had um, a couple that came, um, the wife was trying to make a decision about a surgery, and it, through the conversation, the husband said, well, you know, I'm not going to tell her what to do because if she follows what I think and then it doesn't work out, then it's my fault. And and so I was able to say, well, you know, what is it you would like from him? And she was able, kind of in that safe environment, to say, well, I don't want you to tell me what to do, but I want you to listen to me. And I want you to be a sounding board. And he's like, oh, I, I can do that. So it's like uh, um, making it possible for people to, to support the patient in the ways that they want to be supported, um, I think, is a really um, important part of the process. And the other thing is, in terms of making the, the decision, you can talk with both people about what's important to you and, and what's important to you, the person that's sitting there next to them, so that they can see where they're feeling similarly and where things differ and they know where the conversation need, needs to lead. So I think that can be really helpful. Um, and well. that's probably a perfect segue into our last topic, which is courage. And with this, we were really talking about power dynamics. So, um, you know, even with the best physician and even with really engaged patient, there is the reality of power dynamics. There's issues with candor, honest disclosure. Uh, one of the interesting things in my work is people are actually more likely to ask honest or embarrassing questions in a virtual environment versus when they're sitting right in front of you. Um, but we still need to encounter this during, during these conversations and throughout this process. So, Sue, you started talking about the health coaches, and I'm very interested to know, and then probably interested to hear from Erica, because you have a new person in the room who is, you know, helping to facilitate this conversation um, and maybe changing that power dynamic a little bit. So, so we actually um, have a couple of different programs. The one that I was just talking about, um, that health coach is usually not in the visit with the patient. They are, patients are referred or self-referred for a separate um, visit with us. But we have another program that I think is one of our coolest programs that we have at the center um, called the Patient Support Corps, which was actually a program that was developed out at UCSF um, by a guy named Jeff Belcora. And what we do with, with that program is we actually train um, volunteers, mostly students, um, primarily um, like pre-med type students, although we've had other students as well. We've got a couple of community um, volunteers in a technique to help patients um, brainstorm their questions and concerns before going to a visit, and then they'll go to the visit with the patient and take notes for them, so that's when they're in the room, and um, with the permission of everyone in the room, audio record the visit. And there's really um, two uh, pieces of this. One is to change the dynamic in terms of you walk into a, a 
visit with your doctor, and that doctor's got an agenda as to what needs to happen during that visit. And, but the patient often has an agenda that maybe is aligned with the doctor's and maybe it might be quite different. And um, by helping a patient to figure out what their concerns are ahead of time, it helps to get that agenda into the visit. And um, one of the things that that our volunteers are trained to do is to not suggest what patients should ask and not to answer any questions. That was always a concern of the clinicians is, you know, these students that you're having talk to them, they don't have any medical information. You know, that's going to be dangerous having them talk to my patients. Well, they don't provide any medical information. They are simply eliciting from the patient what, what their questions and concerns are. And then they summarize it in, a, in an easy, to quickly scan document never longer than a page so it doesn't freak out the doctor that you walk in with you know four pages because you can't deal with that as, as a clinician. Um, but what we find is it really does change the dynamic in the room because first of all the patients walk in feeling more prepared. They're less likely to forget to ask the things that have been keeping them up at night because they've thought about it. It's on paper and oh by the way you've got the person that helped you do this sitting in the room and if at the end of the visit something hasn't been addressed they can say Dan, we had on the list that you wanted to ask about such and so, did, did you still want to ask about that? And you might say, no, I'm all set, or yes, I do. Um, the other thing that is part of that, which I think is one of the most powerful pieces, and it reminds me of the um, kayaking story that was told earlier today, is we put right up on the top, um, we've been calling it a power statement, I'm not sure if that's the best term, but that's what we call it, where it's like, what's the one thing you really want the clinician to know? And for some people, it's the fact that I want to be able to put the kayak back on my car. For other people, it's I want them to know that I am really terrified of X, Y, or Z happening to me so that the clinician knows that that's the, really the most important thing to this patient. And I have, I have gone to visits with patients where I have seen that totally change the dynamic in a visit. Um, I accompanied a patient to, um, who had breast cancer who happened to also be um, a cardiology nurse. And she had taken care of patients with, um, who had been on a certain chemo that caused, um, that potentially could cause heart problems. And she was terrified that she might need that um, chemotherapy. And she was actually come, going in to see her surgeon, so that wasn't the surgeon's um, area of expertise, but the surgeon walked in the room and said, I don't usually start here, but I see that this is a big concern of yours, and I can tell you that from the um, testing that you had earlier that that particular drug isn't something that we're going to be recommending for, for you. You could see the patient completely calm down and then they could have the conversation about surgery. Otherwise she would have still been, that's what would have been on, on her mind. Um, so I think um, it can change the dynamic in the room. It makes it so the clinician is aware of what's most important to the patient and I've had clinicians tell me um, one rheumatologist told me that there was a patient she'd been following for a very long time and then the patient used this service and the patient and the doctor said at the end um, it's the first time that they left and both of them felt like it had been a good visit um, because um, the patient was more organized they got all the questions answered and um, uh, there wasn't that last thing you know as she's right. walking out the room yeah. Okay, so we just have a, a few minutes left, and if people want to line up to ask any questions just while you're doing that. Uh, for the rest of you, in terms of power dynamics, is there anything that you've seen that has been especially helpful at disrupting that or at helping with that? I know, Karen, you've looked at a few things that have helped, and I'm sure in both of your experience. Um, yeah, I mean, in our experience, um, mainly like decision aids are very helpful um, in printing off, you know, any questions or notes that people have. Bringing an advocate, a family member, is, tends to be very helpful. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, within, we've looked at it particularly within decision aids, but, um, you know, more broadly, as was discussed here, really having the opportunity to think about your goals and also come back. Um, not so having time. to make yeah. the decision immediately. Yep. Only thing I'd say is there's a direct relationship between trust and my courage. Um, because when I don't have the trust, I don't have the courage. And really, that's when I bring my wife or my daughter-in-law because they'll take care of it, you know. But um, anyway, that's it. <laughs> All right, let's take a question. Yeah. 
Yeah, just a, a quick comment and maybe a, a feedback on the comment. It has to do with the courage element and the shared decision-making process. And, and I actually uh, do a lot to train patient, patients to be engaged. And so that's a hard process. So we're working on the demand side of the equation, not the supply side of the equation. And when you actually get somebody to take a step to, be, to have the courage to challenge a doctor's assumption or to ask a question, why are we doing this? Is there another way to do this? And that doctor looks him in the eye and says, who went to medical school? Or, you know, don't confuse your, your Google search with my medical degree. You've just shut that guy down permanently. And it's, it's really frustrating to, ch to try and change that culture when you're working on the demand side and you're trying to get somebody really who's intimidated, they're sick, they're at their worst possible point, and you just shut them down. Not you guys individually, but the system does that. So I guess it's just a comment. What would you say to that? How would you suggest <clears throat> maybe overcoming that? Fire them. <laughs> Um, I, I am yeah, a go. big believer in measurement and feedback, and I think that that's an important component that we don't really get at. And I also work on, the, I didn't say I do work on the policy side, and I think that as we, you know, create measures of patients' experiences and what that's like and feed that back and start to make that part of the um, reimbursement, um, incentives, then I think that those th people will care a lot more. I don't know if, um, you know, the uh, moral or do good or, you know, kind of approach is going to work to reach the masses. That would be my. Well, and I know there's been a lot of conversations about uh, training, uh, not just clinicians, but med students. And then I think there's the problem getting back to the culture of care of modeling that kind of behavior. You know, so at Yale, for example, you have great people actually in leadership modeling that type of behavior. And you can't expect to train clinicians and then have them see a different type of behavior and do that. So I think that's where it becomes really hard to get at that culture change. I was um, pleased to hear about that core patient program or whatever. Um, I'm wondering if anybody knows of any other initiatives or programs or curriculums or anything that helps people develop those kinds of skills before they become patients. Um, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about everyone talks about, you know, end of life planning, do it before you're in the ICU so that you're not in this crisis mode and you're able to have a meaningful conversation about those things before they happen. And I think Tom mentioned something about, you know, if I could go back and start in pediatrics, I would do that. So, you know, what if we started, you know, having these kind of conversations in schools or something like that before people get mm -hmm. sick? Does anyone, and if not, I mean, what role do healthcare, well, in addition to, uh, what role do, do healthcare providers have in helping patients develop those skills, learn how to, you know, ask good questions and set realistic expectations about their illnesses? Um, I want to answer that tangentially. So my son was getting ready to uh, go to Zimbabwe in a development aid, doing development aid work, and he invited me to come uh, meet with his team and talk about health. And um, I did this, you know, uh, you know, um, be careful of the water you drink, keep it zipped, you know, your like basic public health stuff. But then I said, okay, all you people sitting around there, I want you to pick a health partner so that if something happens to you when you're away, um, that that person is committed to hanging with you till you have a definitive um, treatment. So then they went off, and my son, um, we didn't hear, you know, it was before internet, so, you know, we'd hear from him like, you know, every three weeks or so we get a letter, and then it went like three months. And I got a letter. Hi, my name is, you know, Jennifer or whatever. I'm Simon's health partner. Uh, Simon got malaria. And, um, you know, we got him to a Western clinic, and he's still pretty sick, but he's doing okay. This is how you get hold of me. So I felt like, I thought, oh, God, I was a great dad. You know, really, I did, I did great things. But I felt like it was, you know, a teaching moment about having 
um, having a team, you know, and, and, you know, like, so I think it's, it's incumbent upon clinician training, but I felt like this was, you know, person training. <laughs> That's great. And I'll give one other example around anticipatory decision making. So much in healthcare we can anticipate. One of those things is whether or not women should start mammography screening between the ages of 40 and 50. It's not a surprise and it shouldn't be a surprise to any woman when she walks into the office that their doctor might talk to them about getting a mammogram. Why don't we anticipate that and start to move those conversations outside of the clinical setting, allowing women to um, reflect on the data and see what matches with their own personal risk, their sense of their risk, and what's right for them. So we've been working with a nonprofit called The Patient Revolution. They were formed out of the Mayo Clinic, and we've been doing group um, peer sessions around um, mammography screening for the decision uh, for women who are aged 40 to 50, and we're currently looking to expand that work to cardiovascular disease prevention. Again, something that we can anticipate. I know ahead of time that I might have a conversation with you about whether or not a statin is right for you. Why shouldn't you know that before you get to the office? So, you know, really taking these conversations outside of the clinic, um, putting them in groups, having people creating space for people to talk about these things, feel them, and think about what's important to them. So much of healthcare, I think, could be shifted in that direction. Hello. I, a, brief, a brief comment. Um, thank you all for, for this great panel. Uh, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, that there's this outfit that most people know about here called PCORI, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and it funds projects that produce um, evidence that will support shared decision making by patients where there's an evidence gap and um, a patient needs this evidence to be able to make a decision based on their characteristics and values. Um, PCORI is going to be defunded in two years and I just wanted to make a plug for, um, for people in this, in this group to support it because it really is, is critical to shared decision making. Thank you. Um, to, uh, thank you very much for, um, for this panel and this pretty deep, uh, meaningful discussion into shared decision making. Just had a brief comment and a question. Um, you mentioned the change in power dynamic and then the tools for shared decision making. And I've done a lot of work with six to 12 year olds and really looking at how to create a participatory healthcare system for six to 12 year olds. And one of the things that um, we did was to shift the dynamic was we moved the conversation from talking to crayons and paper um, to really kind of moving to where six to 12 year olds felt most comfortable. And we started the visit um, where children are in the waiting room asking them to draw what they like to eat, where they like to play, and then starting the visit by talking about the drawing and kind of setting the power level at the level of where the child is most comfortable. Um, so kind of like building on that, um, have you come across examples like that of really looking at tools for shared decision making um, for children kind of starting at that age or more adolescent age um, and kind of thinking about um, the tools not just being verbal but using other means of communication, whether it's crayons or something else? I actually just did a great workshop with Katie McCurdy. I wouldn't even limit that to children. Like we were drawing our own like last visit to the ER and thinking through the decision. Says, I, I actually yeah, too. yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so doing that type of thing or, you know, even a collage, different things like that, or writing is a good one for patients too in terms of helping people process things. There's some good evidence that you process things when you write in a way that you don't when you speak and it can actually help with those emotions and anxiety, but help people really come in to have a better conversation. Hi. Um, Jerry, you're absolutely right. Shared decision-making tools are not what the process is. And having worked at the Informed Medical Decisions Foundation for a couple of years, um, actually getting some tools from paper to mobile, I, we really learned that. And now that shared decision-making tools are sort of appearing with different patient education vendors and there's talk about um, rating them um, and I really want to know though from other doctors here 
specifically Rashika and, and others who are in practice, where are we, how f close are we to getting this into standing orders? Because, you know, very few people outside of this room really understand shared decision making. And my family members keep saying, gee, I, I was getting ready to sign to informed consent. And I don't know that I ever read the risks and benefits. I don't, I mean, how many options are there? So, you know, where are we system, system, systemically and in, through policy in getting this moving? It's a good question. Are there... Is you Rashika want, still um, here, <laughs> or do you want to start? <laughs> I'll give it to Rashika if they're here, but I can start from policy and from a national standpoint, we're really far. There's um, a few beacons. Um, you may know that Washington State passed a law um, where uh, clinicians who practice shared decision making as an alternative to informed consent are afforded increased protection against litigation and some malpractice carriers are offering discounts. That would mean using a dis certified decision aid in the context of a shared decision making encounter. Um, they're not really being utilized. There's a few things within Medicare, within CMS, that, um, uh, lung cancer screening and um, a procedure for AFib, uh, left atrial appendage closure, to have to have that CAT scan, to have that procedure, you need to demonstrate that you've um, conducted a shared decision-making encounter. Um, but those are really small things. We're working on a measure of informed consent, sort of backing into shared decision-making so that we can build some quality standards around informed consent, including the timing in which that discussion happens so that it doesn't happen in the OR, in the uh, waiting room, the day of the procedure. And once you back it out of that day, then we can start to really have more conversations around what are the risks and benefits and what were those alternatives again, and maybe you might be more inclined to grab that decision aid. And, um, and I go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think one of the problems still is that most of the decision aids that are available, uh, they're created by commercial entities, and in order to have access to, the, to many of the decision aids, whatever healthcare system you're being seen at has to have contracted with them. So, you know, in my ideal world, all of these things would be available out in um, the public domain so that it's not dependent on has your healthcare system contracted and, you know, which decision aid company have they contracted with. And so that I think there's still a lot of um, work that has to be done along those lines. So My have, colleague, oh, do sorry, I'm just doing a quick time check because I think we're at time. Okay. So unfortunately, I think we're going to have to, if you want to, no, yeah, we'll, finish do you your comment. Or, or do you wanna, okay. Danny, do we have time for one more question? Uh, <laughs> well, well, we really don't. Okay, okay. Unfortunately, we're going to have to cut it off there, but thank you, and thank you guys so much.